hello and welcome to Living Faith Lutheran Church. I wanted to take a moment to welcome each and every one of you and give you a little insight into who we are and what we're about before we begin worship today. The name of our congregation is, of course, Living Faith, and the word congregation is inclusive of all those who choose to worship with us, no matter where they are in the world. The reality is we're no longer defined by a simple physical address. The Martin Luther in me wants to ask the question, what does this mean? It means that the Holy Spirit has powerful things in store, and the daily and the and daily, the Spirit is broadening our horizons and beckoning, motivating, urging, and pushing us to a deeper actualization of our name. Thanks, Pastor. That really cleared that all up. What this means is that I was thinking about our name, and I had one of those schoolhouse rock moments when I realized that the living in our name functions both as an adjective and as a verb. As an adjective, living describes the noun faith as one with, as Luther would describe it, a profound love of God for God's people and for all of the whole creation. As a verb, what that's where things get exciting. As we worship, and worship is not just this short video time in the midst of a 168-hour week, worship is about living faith. The Schoolhouse Rock song says, verb. I get my thing from action, to work, to play, to live, to love. All 168, 24-7, 365, until our faith becomes sight in the kingdom of God. So we wish you peace and invite you to live faith with us whenever you, wherever you reside on our planet, to be active and to bring justice, hope, peace, and comfort to a hurting world, to clothe the naked, to lift up the lowly, to bring healing to the sick, to feed the hungry, to console the brokenhearted, and to make Christ known both in both word and deed. If you so desire, if you're searching for a church family either to worship with in person or from afar, a family with which to share your joys and sorrows and triumphs and failings, your hopes and your fears, your gifts and your talents, we want you to know that you're welcome with us. And I would be remiss if I didn't make it uh, make it aware, make everyone aware that you can subscribe to our newsletters and find my contact information at livingfaithlutheran.org. We hope to hear from you. God bless, and let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, Alleluia. In the waters of baptism, we have passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ, and we are a new creation. For this saving mystery, let us bless God, who, has, who was, who is, and who is to come. We thank you, God, for the river of life, flowing freely from your throne through the earth, through the city, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters you flood us with mercy, and our sin is drowned forever. You open the gate of righteousness, and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ, you calm the troubled waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. 
You have become our salvation. Now breathe upon the water and awaken your church once more. Claim us again as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst. Cleanse our hearts. Wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and lamb, we be honor, glory, and praise, and thanksgiving. Amen. Lord be with you, and let us pray. O God, Judge Eternal, you love justice and you hate oppression, and you call us to share your zeal for truth. Give us courage to take our stand with all victims of bloodshed and greed, and following your servants and prophets to look to the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading today is Jeremiah 23, 23 through 29. Because Jeremiah preaches the unpopular message of God's judgment, he suffers rejection. Today's reading distinguishes between the true prophet like Jeremiah, who speaks God's word, and the false prophet who misleads the people through dreams. One is like wheat, and the other is like workless straw. Am I a God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord. Do I not feel heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophecy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will the hearts 
of the prophets ever turn back, those who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart? They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? It's not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The psalm today is Psalm 82. Please read with me in the bold text. God stands to charge the divine council assembled, giving judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show favor to the wicked? Save the weak and the orphan, defend the humble and needy. Rescue the weak and the poor. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. They do not know, neither do they understand. They wander about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are gods, and all of you children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. The second reading today is Hebrews 11, verse 29, and chapter 12, verse 2. The author of Hebrews presents us with rich stories of faith. In a long list of biblical heroes, we find examples of trust in God that enabled them to face the trials of life faithfully. In addition to this cloud of witnesses, we have Jesus, the perfect model of faithful endurance. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been circled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute who did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah of David, and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fires, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received their dead by resurrection, others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better so that they would not apart from us to be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sun that clings so closely, excuse me, and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Jesus delivers harsh words about the purifying and potentially divisive effects of obedience to God's call. 
The way of the cross often leads followers to encounter hostility and rejection, even from those they love. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it's going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see uh, the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat. And that happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the uh, appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When I hear the words of the second lesson, I can't help but to think of the Olympics for some reason. Well, one favorite moment that I had for the Olympics was when the 1980 American hockey team took gold. But there was a huge buildup there to that moment. More recently, though, there was a moment that sort of slipped by. It was the women's 100-meter freestyle of 2016, and I just so happened to be watching it on television live. The ending was improbable and completely unexpected. The announcers weren't even acknowledging one of the U.S. competitors. The Australian Campbell sisters and the Canadian Penny Oleksiak were supposed to be on the podium for that event. I'm thinking maybe the, the um, television station was taken by surprise and wasn't planning on featuring this race because they weren't expecting an American to do so well. But then Simone Manuel swam the race of her life. She embodied the effort and the character that the Olympics have always represented for me personally. I watch the Olympics and I always think of the motto of the Olympics, Sidious Altius Fortius, faster, higher, stronger. I like to see someone, someone seemingly unassuming that has simply come to give it their, uh, to give it their all in hopes of being the best on that day. They are not the ones that know they are the, are the best, but you can see that they want to be faster, higher, and stronger, a little better each time. The motto is not fastest, highest, strongest, which would seem to be a little too assuming. Well, I know everyone at the Olympics wants to win the gold. But the ones that seem to come out of nowhere, well, they're kind of like Minnie Pearl used to say on the Grand Ole Opry, that they are just so proud to be there. When they take the field, and, or in this case the pool, and leave every ounce of themselves on it, and they cross the line or touch the wall first, they, the look on their faces is absolutely unmistakable. They are victorious, and they become racked with emotion. That was the case with Simone Manuel. She pushed herself to the limit, and it was spectacular. She surged as the others flagged at the end, and I almost jumped on the, off the bed I was sitting on. I was filled with awe and excitement. She was thrilled when she saw that she had placed by the little lights on her diving stand where she touched the wall. But when she looked up and saw a one 
by her name. I saw a range of emotion that made me so proud to be her fellow countryman. She didn't care that she had tied and had to share the first place podium. She cared that she fulfilled the spirit of the Olympics, exceeded expectations, and overcame every obstacle, and that in doing her very best, it made her the best on that day, and by the way, in history to that point. America cheered for her, and they showed all the other, uh, and they showed at that time all the other swimmers in the locker room going absolutely crazy and cheering for her. It was a great moment for our country, and an inspirational moment for all the young swimmers out there. And it was an incredibly happy moment for Simone. That feeling, that feeling is what our second lesson is talking about the heroes of the faith, those that accomplished great things, those that endured terrible hardships, those that died for what they believed, those that made terrible decisions maybe sometimes or mistakes, but continued on, those that ran the race of a lifetime but went unnoticed. And all of them, every one of them, witnessing you and me in our journey, in our race, and pulling for us like the swimmers in the locker room and millions around the world. But this race is different. This is one of those races that might seem simple on its face, even maybe really easy. The training plan is laid out in Hebrews. Lay aside the weight of sin. You're going to run the race. Getting rid of weight will make it easier. Makes good sense. Check. Run the race before us by simply following Jesus. And he did it perfectly. So it will be a snap, right? Jesus laid out the parameters of the race. To run it perfectly, all you have to do is Love everybody, every day, all the time. Well, that sounds like the easiest race ever, right? That is until we actually step back and look at the course that is life in the real world. And until we read those few words near the end of the reading, the fine, um, well, the fine print, as it were who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Loving everyone proves to be much more difficult than we would like to think, as we must take up our cross. It's really more like the struggles of that uh, Steve Austin broken skull challenge, if you've ever seen it. Very difficult and painful struggles against obstacles and other people that want to hate you or beat you. Think of your enemies in life. You know, the ones that seem to really deserve not being liked. The ones the world tells us we have every right to hate. The ones for whom the justification is so clear or how about the ones that you are uh, okay with, but your family can't stand, or that your neighbors or friends hate. So often in this world, people turn on and hate the people that care for the people that they hate or look down on or do not understand. That's what happened to Jesus, and that's what the path, the race course, looks like. The course that Jesus ran to victory was not an easy jaunt or a casual swim. He ran directly down through the valley of the shadow of death. His path was straight and unswerving. He ran to the tax collectors, and he loved them. He hurtled disease and fear and ran to the lepers and the diseased and the infirmed, and he loved them. 
He ran to the enemies of his people, the Samaritans, and he lifted them up as heroes in stories, and he loved them. He ran to the sinful who were about to be stoned, and he loved them. He ran to the widows, the orphans, and the forgotten, the outcasts, and he loved them. Finally, his race took him to the cross to secure victory for all the other runners. Talk about not worrying about sharing or, or tying, and he died there. He refused to avoid or claim some sort of buy on the hardest of obstacles. Instead, he embraced it and even loved and forgave those, that would be us, that put him there. Let's face it, we don't love like Jesus. It's so much easier to run around the obstacles, isn't it? But that's not the race before us. But there is assurance for us. Those heroes of the faith, they're there cheering us on. Not one of them ran a perfect race. Some of them ran some pretty pitiful and pathetic ones. Yet that is the beautiful thing about the one that secured victory for us. We are forgiven for our poor form, our mistakes, and our obstacle dodging or tripping up on them. So if the race is already won, we might ask, why run? Why put ourselves through it? Why endure the pain and the heartache? The, question, the answer, excuse me, is thankfulness. The answer is love and compassion in the here and now for those who are suffering and who are unloved. That is how Jesus reaches out to the hurting of the world with our hands. The, the thing that helped me to begin thinking about the gospel for today was an article by Pastor David Celery. In the gospel, Jesus talks about, uh, about bringing division. Given all the division brewing in our communities, nation, and the world today, it is not a gospel that I look forward to talking about. But this article helped me to look at it in perspective, in a perspective that I had never taken. Jesus did not walk through his life wagging his finger at us or encouraging us to kick butt and take names. He did not come in with I told you so's and harsh confrontation. What he did was to proclaim love and to love people. Well, Pastor Celery wrote, And as Christ predicts, living in his love is not the end of turmoil. It is the beginning. Those who reject Jesus in their own lives often want to purge him from ours. Sometimes casually, sometimes actively, sometimes violently. Sadly, too often, we Christians have a spotty record of meeting these challenges, exchanging blow for blow. Perhaps it's an answer to some primal us or them reflex. Or perhaps, like Adam, we are tempted to usurp the powers of God, all of which flies in the face of Jesus' very special charge to build the kingdom by loving God and neighbor. In today's context, he wants us to love and respect all of our neighbors, the believers and the non-believers. We are not latter-day Pharisees spoiling for a fight over doctrine. Christ does not keep score by theological arguments won or by the relative size of our congregations. We are only responsible for serving him and proclaiming him. That means we love and forgive and then love and forgive some more, end quote. In closing, it reminds me of the Light Brigade poem by Tennyson. It says, stormed at with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell. 
but we, instead of fighting with swords and cannons and weapons of destruction, we should follow the advice, maybe, of Albert Einstein. He wrote, It may not be possible in one generation to eradicate the combative instinct. It is not even desirable to eradicate it entirely. People should continue to fight, but they should fight for things worthwhile, not for imaginary geographical lines. Maybe racial prejudice and private greed, draped in the colors of patriotism. Their arms should be weapons of the spirit, not shrapnel and tanks. Think of what a world we could build if the power unleashed in war were applied to constructive tasks, he says. We must be prepared to make the same heroic sacrifices for the cause of peace that we make ungrudgingly for the cause of war. There is no task that is more important or closer to my heart, he said. Nothing that I can say or do will change the structure of the universe. But maybe by raising my voice, I can help the greatest of all, all causes. Goodwill among men and peace on earth. Amen. Today's prayers of intercession. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain your church. We pray for all who dedicate their lives to serving your people. Renew our commitment to our siblings in faith around the globe and bless the work of our ecumenical and interfaith partners, merciful God, receive our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain your creation. We pray for all places affected by natural disasters. Transform the devastation of floods and fires into fertile gold, ground for new life and growth. Fill heaven and earth with your life-giving spirit. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain the nations. We pray for all elected officials. Kindle in them a desire to administer your justice. Strengthen their resolve to defend those who are vulnerable and to stand publicly against all forms of oppression. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain those who are oppressed. We pray for people harmed by racist discrimination a biased discrimination, and all people discriminated against based on their gender identity or sexual orientation. Rescue from all systems that degrade our fellow human beings. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain this assembly. We pray for this community, celebrating with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep and all in need especially the people of Ukraine. 
your servants on our prayer list, those in our prayer bowl, and those whom we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. In our joy and in our tears, be near us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we remember the saints who have gone before us. May we run with perseverance the race set before us until we find our rest in you, merciful God. Receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May gl our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus, the God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia! Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia! Thanks be to God.